So good morning to everybody and welcome to the session on the value chain discussion on the uh, animal industry. Uh, obviously value chains across the world are in turmoil. Uh, given the COVID crisis that we have, uh, we have to make adaptations. We have to still maintain our global uh, competitiveness. Uh, South Africa's agricultural sector generally is globally very competitive. It's a, it's a massive asset to our country, but we are challenged in these times and we need to understand how we adapt, how we uh, cooperate, collaborate, uh, even to maintain our competitiveness and to address our, our changed market system. Consumer patterns are changing, etc. So uh, we're very fortunate to have four uh, key experts in the animal industry uh, on our panel today. Uh, we have Martina Stander, the CEO of Country Bird Holdings, and welcome to Martinez. Uh, we have Gerald Willefier of uh, the South African Feedlot Association, and welcome to Gerald. We have Johan Kutsia from um, the African Pork Producers Organization. Welcome, Johan. And Dani Woodendahl, who will join us uh, from the uh, veterinarian net and a very experienced uh, in South Africa. So I'm going to start with Martinez with you in order, and uh, I'm going to ask you the first, uh, the first question. If you can give us, um, Andrew Bird Holdings, uh, your agricultural food value chain approach uh, to the local market. How do you see the, the, the value chain that you're operating in South Africa? Yes, thanks, um, John. A uh, bit of background, maybe. Uh, the elements of the value chain on our side in the uh, poultry industry um, starts with feed, uh, then the breed, uh, which is all about genetics, the agriculture, which is about the farming side, processing, obviously, in the abattoirs, and then distribution, and then sales. Sales, obviously, more about, and specifically, about the market. History of this value chain in poultry uh, as a long one of forward integration, maize farmers uh, formed co-ops, then uh, stored maize, then started to mill the maize, then started uh, to feed chicken, eventually uh, slaughtering, etc. Um, there's a long lead time to fill this pipeline. Uh, the broilers that we slaughter uh, to produce the meat is the fourth generation. We start with great-grandparents, grandparents, then your parents stock and then your broilers. So effectively, you start with males and females, uh, pure line uh, on your great-grandparent side, uh, males and females of uh, female line. One produces lots of eggs, the female line, male line produces lots of uh, protein. Then you start with a multiplication and a crossbreeding to uh, reduce the cost. So every hen gives you about 160 uh, eggs between 20 and 60 weeks when they sexually mature. Um, so the, to illustrate the multiplication, one kilogram of that fluffy chicks right at the beginning of this line can produce uh, 10 tons of meat uh, two years later and then for another period uh, extending over two years plus. You can enter this value chain at various stages. You can buy in feed and then just do the outgrowing. Um, you can just slaughter. You can just be on the agri side and maybe on the parent stock side. In terms of CBH, we own the full um, chain. Um, we do that so that we can produce the lowest cost uh, chicken at the end of the day. We do our other outsource um, our broiler growing. Uh, to contract growers. In terms, uh, we also have a focus not only on the SA but also on the rest of Africa. Uh, consumption of chicken in South Africa is about 40 kilograms per capita per year and the rest of Africa combined sits at about 4 kilograms. Uh, chicken is most versatile, most affordable protein source we believe. And therefore, there's big scope in Africa. So we've also focused our supply chain in Africa. In terms of the local market, uh, it's all very much about demand for us. I think we're very fortunate. Chicken is always in, the, the, in demand. 
uh, if there are problems in the value chain, it's really on the supply side, either being oversupplied or undersupplied. Um, if one thinks of oil, there's no demand in uh, no matter how many cutbacks you do, you cannot fix the fact that there currently is no demand. Chicken remains uh, in demand. Um, we um, obviously know that uh, price and convenience drive consumer decision. Uh, initially, chickens were sold live, then they were slaughtered and frozen. Then uh, the whole birds were, you know, the ultimate uh, at the pinnacle of of, con of, of uh, development and convenience for the consumer. Later, it was cut up in portions. We uh, now see that those IKF two kilogram portions are more of a commodity and um, convenience in terms of replacing home meals is now at the forefront. So you're fully cooked uh, and you're further processed uh, chicken. So for us as CVH, we firstly want to determine where do we wish to play in the market. Uh, we have more of a niche approach than just a low cost commodity approach. So we focus a lot on quick service restaurants and then we design the value chain um, to deliver the right bird at uh, the lowest cost in uh, the right numbers. Thank you, Matthias. Uh, I, I want to get back to the QSR, especially now that they've been closed. But I first want to, to, to talk to you about the international market. You, you spoke about the potential in, in, in Africa. Uh, is this something that you are pursuing uh, fairly proactively? Do you think that there's a, 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 a good growing market that you can service there? Yes, John. Um, we have a passion for chicken uh, into Africa. We think there is definitely an opportunity. Uh, what we do is we don't export chicken from South Africa. We establish chicken operations in countries in Africa. So those elements of the value chain that I mentioned, uh, we replicate in Africa. It differs from country to country. There is not one model that fits all. Depends on the market. Sometimes the market just selling live birds. Other times uh, the market uh, wants processed chicken uh, frozen in, and into portions. So the breed rights is very crucial if you want to do that. Um, you need to have the right genetics. We're very fortunate in that regard with our strategic relationship with uh, Aviagen. Um, we focus mostly on Nigeria, Zambia, and Botswana. Those are our biggest operations, but we're also in uh, Mozambique, we're in Zimbabwe, um, we're in Swaziland, we're in, uh, in Namibia. Um, right, um, that's, that's John, uh, what we do in Africa. Okay, thanks, uh, Martinez. Perhaps we, I want to get back to the, the issue of the impact of, of COVID-19. Uh, on, on, on your specific part of the value chain, you did mention it, and I know that you're involved with QSRs, the food service restaurants. Uh, they've been closed now. How have you coped uh, uh, in terms of the takeoff of your product? Because uh, clearly that, that must be uh, quite a challenge for you. Yes, um, John, I mentioned that the mine is never an issue. Um, in terms of our niche approach, in terms of QSRs, we have uh, some very significant complexities uh, and COVID-19 is impacting quite significantly. Um, so we see that a lot of the operations obviously are closed, therefore it's very hard to do uh, payments to maintain the businesses. We're obviously concerned about the survival of this uh, part of the industry. We see that um, it is important that these um, uh, operations are opened again, uh, also in terms of food security down the line, because if there is no demand from that side, in cases uh, we, one will consider, and in such case one would and could consider uh, some down placements, and uh, that will impact uh, on future uh, food security. I think the other thing, of course, is post. COVID, we would also expect, uh, you know, the consumer being more constrained than ever uh, because of uh, job losses. We already know the economy is in a, in, a, in a deep and dark place. 
Um, so it will be a, a tough environment uh, to get back to. But uh, we also know that uh, you know things things return to normality after time. So um, we are holding thumbs, we're supporting where we can, and um, and we're looking forward to when the economy has restarted again, rather sooner than later. Perhaps I can just ask you while well, we're on the uh, uh, value chain is the new master plan. Have you seen benefits? Uh, uh, accruing to the industry as such yet, uh, and also with the new tariff uh, dispensation? Yes, um, John, I think the most positive thing is that this master plan was co-created. Uh, in the past, we always wanted um, government to supply us with the enabling environment. Uh, from government side, they wanted to see focus on transformation. They wanted to see growth in the industry. Um, and I think we missed each other uh, sort of first waiting for the other party. Um, so we co-created something now. Uh, there are quite a couple of pillars of this master plan. And uh, I think in terms of international access, uh, certainly one of the pillars is, is to add um, value to our chicken and um, the export market provides that. So, um, but it's early days. I think that's the other important thing. We need to get some government-to-government -government, uh, interaction going um, in terms of certification, uh, for instance, residue monitoring, independent um, inspection. So facilities are required from, uh, from the government, from the Department of Agriculture, uh, services, veterinary services, uh, laboratory services and then this interaction with uh, counterparts of the government in the uh, countries that we target. There are opportunities, for instance, uh, the EPA, the Economic Partnership Agreement with uh, Europe. We as South Africans love um, meat on the bone. Um, we have less of a taste for the breast meat, whereas Europe is the opposite as part of the developed uh, markets, countries, breast meat is everything. So um, on the back of the fact that we are internationally competitive, um, we have been measured over five periods by the, by the University of Wageningen in the Netherlands, uh, probably the foremost agricultural uh, educational institution, uh, tertiary institution. So we have been uh, found to be in the top five, six in terms of lowest cost production of a carcass in the world. Uh, and therefore, if a country like Thailand successfully exports a lot of breast meat to uh, Europe, then uh, we are on, on par with Thailand in terms of cost, and certainly we can, and we have the EPA in our favor with Thailand um, has a limit in terms of a quota. So in theory, the EPA gives us uh, unlimited access to, to the European market, um, but we are currently being blocked on sanitary and phytosanitary measures, and that brings us back to what we need uh, to do as an industry in terms of some elements of self-regulation, investment, but what we also need from government in terms of those facilities, test, and the independent nature of uh, verification. So uh, opportunity, I think also in terms of uh, transformation, I mentioned the uh, outgrow models. We have a lot of opportunity for black farmers. Um, uh, land and farming is a very topical issue. We can, in a sustainable way, provide such opportunities for uh, black farmers. So uh, lots of elements of the um, master plan, it's very positive, uh, but as I say, it's still early days. Perfect. It's so good to hear of all the opportunities that there are, both into Africa, in the local market, and also into Europe. And uh, I, 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 while globalization is taking a backseat in the COVID crisis, I think it will reopen at time, and then we've got to be smart in looking for those opportunities. I also really commend the industry we're doing those studies with bargaining and to look at the competitiveness and, and, and to see how we compete to other countries in terms of being a low-cost producer. And that's the right sort of attitude to, to for our industry. 
And one can only welcome that. So Martinez, I'm going to come back to you again just now. There's still one or two questions I want to ask you, especially around the informal market. But I want to ask Gibbles, um, uh, we've just dealt with the, the, the boiler industry, which is the single biggest industry in agriculture in South Africa, but I think beef is second biggest. And uh, you play a, a, an absolute key role, uh, both in the local market and, and uh, your competitiveness has brought you in the last four years uh, in the beef industry to become a net exporter when we were a net importer up until about 2014. Uh, th this is such fantastic news for South Africa in many ways because there are the a whole lot of value chains that feed up into your, into, into your products. Uh, perhaps you can give us a sense of, of what's happening in the South African market and uh, what, what's being done to increase or improve the competitiveness uh, and the value that you add to the South African consumer. Good, thanks, John. Um, maybe just to latch on to what Martina said, and I'd like to add from our side, from the from the beef portion or the beef side, there's one role player or value chain player which we, from our side, always left or leaves out, and that's actually government, the non-governmental organisations, the NGOs, and so on, and, uh, the old DAF. Uh, they play a critical part in what we do, and I think Martina just mentioned it at the back as well at the end of his discussion now with regards to the fighter sanity. And we, on a local perspective, I think what is very important for us is relationships. We've seen in the past that the relationships that created with government is what helps us. Um, and saying that, obviously there's a lot of constraints and issues we deal with on, on, on each specific level of the value chain. If we look at the producers, sometimes, and maybe if I break it down a little bit, we tend to forget that the feedlots where we sit, where I sit, is also part of the primary producer in the value chain. Um, it's not processing yet. Uh, although we've also, in, in the beef industry, integrated backwards and forwards. And a lot of the, and maybe the biggest feedlots in South Africa is all, also the biggest abattoirs. Um, that, although that being said, um, where we are primary, we are actually split up also in, in a cow-calf operator and then a feedlot specific scenario. Um, but trust, we've seen locally what drives us and what helps us is firstly and most importantly is trust and then cooperation. Um, if we work together, we can make it. And I think in the past five years, the last four or five years as he's indicated, we've seen that working together with government helps a lot. Um, and it takes us forward. Uh, it's important to us to deliver the same quality of product which we want to send internationally to the local market. In that, what we've started doing is we've got a classification system in South Africa that looks at, as we know it, an A or an AB or a B with a fat classification from one to six. What we started to do is we've now investigated and started to investigate in another system that looks at uh, grading um, specifically meat. So we said that classification is not the only thing. If we want to compete, and we'll get to international later, but if we want to compete internationally, but locally as well, we need to look at our consumers. What do our consumers want? So a big drive from the total value chain at this stage, stage is uh, visibility, uh, value chain and traceability and visibility specifically but also to look at what does the consumer want. I looked at the Red Meat Research and Development website just two days ago, and what I saw was there's a lot of research done on how do we better the animals, how do we better feed, how do we better this and that in our value chain, but do we actually ask our consumers, the guys that use our products, what do they want, how do they see it? We've seen now in the past few months, or okay, years actually, and, and decades that they've started moving at a grab and go. People do not, young people, do not want to sit down and eat a huge cooked meal. They want fast food. They want to, to they're on the go. With what happened now with the COVID, I mean, I think the, the younger generation is used to this, talking over screens to each other, not engaging face to face. Well, more than, than what the older generations are at this stage. But um, that's a new look. And we've got to, locally and internationally, but locally specifically, um, we've got to look at what does our consumer want. Um, maybe if I go back to, to the producing side more, and we've got a few 
things we look at and what we, what we focus on currently is firstly efficiency. We need to be efficient in what we do. Uh, we've seen that wastage uh, is not on, but wastage in total with regards to labor, with regards to resources, with regards to monitoring uh, wastage as well. Um, market volatility specifically on the producer side uh, or the, the primary side is very important to us. Uh, we've seen a lot of ups and downs in South Africa, unfortunately up until now, and it's maybe how the value chain is put together. We haven't had the opportunity to tap into something like uh, SAFX. Uh, but that's options, and that would take out the volatility of the market. However, that is a big concern on either side of uh, the value chain at this stage with regards to volatility. Um, capital, capital is always a big thing, and one of the bigger feedlots told me just oh, not, not long ago that the only guy that succeeded at the end of the day within a feedlot is the guy that's got the cash flow. And it's all about cash flow. If you can outlast the guy next to you or uh, the situation, the current situation, it's all about cash flow. So capital is of the utmost importance. We can just think of the value of one calf. Uh, and if you stand 10, 20, 50, 50,000 cattle, uh, so capital is of the utmost importance to us. And then I think on a, on a producer level, uh, and I alluded to it earlier with regards to the research, is innovation. We've got to look at innovative ways, and that's what we're doing specifically in a local market is to test how do, how do we operate. We've got a magnitude of animals, registered animals in South Africa, cattle specifically, uh, breeds. And um, we always, horses for courses. Uh, so specific guys like, they say that you choose a, a calf on the color of a calf. Uh, other than that, they're all the same. So uh, it's all about innovation for us. Um, so locally, it's important that we deliver specifically to the needs of our consumers. In the past, and I think there's a lot of talks with regards to nutrition, with regards to uh, growth stimulants. And what we're trying to do at this stage is to say that let's open up our chest. Let's tell the people in South Africa and the world for that matter going forward, how do we look? What do we do? Uh, it's been a very closed system up until recently. And it's time that we tell everybody in South Africa, uh, what do we do with our animals? Uh, we've got, I don't think your people know in South Africa that we've got, the animals have all got rights. Uh, and that is a standard protocol within our quality system to say that animals got rights not to be hindered to be fed, to be treated humanely. So we've got to tell our consumers how we treat, because what we see is that the consumer, uh, they've all got Google. They informed people, our consumers, and we've got to speak to them. Uh, so from a value chain approach locally, what we're saying is we've got to bring meat closer to the table. We've got to shorten the value chain, because what has happened is there's a lot of players within this. We've got to shorten the value chain and we've got to make it affordable. Uh, we are a, 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 in a situation where meat specifically, or red meat specifically, is seen to be a more valuable cut or valuable protein. And um, we need to, to make sure that specifically red meat is put on the table and it could be at the same cost as other protein sources in this case. Thank you, Yvonne. I want to touch again later a little bit on the animal welfare side that you touched on and also the, the, the issue of growth stimulants and, and antibiotics and things which, which I think uh, that communication with a consumer is, is very important, you alluded to it, and we can touch on that. But I want to also uh, for you to go into the to, uh, an aspect that I'm very excited about uh, and that's, that, that shows how, your, how the drive to efficiency has improved in the industry and that's to crack the export market, and we've seen uh, considerable growth. It's only 3% or so, or 4 or 5% of our total production at this stage. Uh, but we've made inroads into markets like China, into the Far East, Middle East, etc., in terms of exports. And, and, and I think this is, this is an, a market that I think South Africa, if we get our act together in terms of sanitary issues, the, the, the uh, issues around biosecurity, etc., that, we, that really can be a growth uh, uh, for South Africa, a growth sector for South Africa. Perhaps give us a bit of uh, background into, in terms of, 
of where the markets are growing, how you see the opportunities expanding, what do we have to have in place to crack those markets? Um, but back to when I started earlier, it's all about trust and we need government. We need the specifics of South African government to assist us. And it's all in trust and relationship with regards to that. And I think, uh, again, our exports boom because of a different approach that industry had uh, with regards to how we approach government. Uh, we're in this together. And I might say that um, the beef industry per se or the red meat industry over the past 12 months had huge issues if we look at the foot and mouth disease outbreak than you actually had in the past. It's almost 24 months now. Um, and what we learned from this is there's still markets that want to operate and deal and negotiate and with South Africa even though there's an outbreak of FMD. So even though there's situations in South Africa that is not as uh, good as we think, uh, our red meat specifically has got a good name internationally. And I think it could go specifically to how we market it firstly, and secondly, to our approach to these guys, not trying to come in, I think, um, in the international market and saying that, we're the best, we know everything, and we want to be everywhere. But uh, sniping, we're actually at this stage um, filling up, and you said, you rightly said that it's 4% of our export, of our media export. But if that didn't happen in the past 24 months, we would have been in dire straits in the red meat industry. If that 4% didn't go, still go out. In the first FMD outbreak, it was bad. Um, exports temporarily did stop. But now on the second issue that we have, we continue because of bilateral agreements we have. And the international market is, is fairly happy with the protocols that we put in place from an individual perspective to say that, how do we deal with our system? Um, that being said, we've now formed a nonprofit company, uh, an NPC, to implement traceability because we are of the opinion that if we can implement traceability, it won't stop the problems that we have with regards to, for example, put in mountains, but it will give some um, relative comfort to our buyers to say that they can trust us with how we manufacture our product and at the end of the day, our breeds and so on. So yes, it's very important. I think I'd like to touch on Africa as well, specifically at this stage, because with regards to the African continental free trade agreement that's opening, uh, what we're seeing is that there's a huge market going up. Um, from a feedlot perspective, what we're saying is we understand that uh, the rest of Africa doesn't understand feedlotting per se. They understand cattle, and we will never take that away from them. But feedlotting and product, or pro providing and producing meat per se, that is something that they can learn. And we've got a very, very huge market. Uh, a lot of the, the guys that we, what, that we meet in our industry is so much focused on China because of the volumes that we can send them. But the risks in China, involved in China, is massive. And we've got to look at other markets as well. There's other markets that are just as lucrative. In, in fact, it could be better. If we just do little tweaks, innovative tweaks, and we can sell our meat uh, very cost effectively, competitive to the rest of the world in other markets other than the Chinese market at this stage. Oh, that's fantastic news. Uh, and uh, we can expand on this one. So interested also in the, the LITS program, the livestock identification and traceability system that you indicated and, and keen to know how, how, how you're progressing. But perhaps, perhaps you can touch on that, but I also want to just ask you, uh, with COVID-19, how is it impacting on demand? And, and, and what, what, what is in the reaction, say, from the feedlot guys in, in dealing uh, with the demand issues? We also know there are issues around the offal, the heads of the etc. Uh, that because uh, that market has been impacted, the in informal market has been impacted. Just give us a sense of of the adaptations that have been necessary and the market movements within COVID nineteen and how the industry has coped with that. Yes, thanks, John. I think obviously COVID influenced all of us um, negatively. However. When I was young, maybe I should say this as well, my father said to me when I got lost in, felt, in the felt, when we were in hunting or so, he said, just sit still. Go down, sit still, look at your surroundings, don't move until you know where you are. And 
be relaxed. And I think what's currently happening is we've got to go back to the basics. Um, and specifically, that's what a lot of the feedlots or, or, or the, the aid meat suppliers, the Abbott was the, the system that to say that let's just do what we do. Um, let's cut the trimmings. Uh, sorry for the pun, but let's cut and see exactly where we are. Uh, look at our consumers again, because what we saw is that the demand, specifically locally, is different. Um, you mentioned the offal and the heads and so on, the informal sector. It was very important to us that the informal sector continues. Uh, we haven't really seen the allevi alleviation at this stage from the informal market uh, opening up again. But that being said, we need to say that the informal market is the informal market. And we've had some issues with the informal market or government trying to regulate the, the informal market as if it's formal. Um, there's a reason why it's informal. And it actually uh, assisted us greatly in taking these awful and the heads out of our system and, and selling it on, 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 on the informal market. So it helped a lot. If we look at specifically the consumers, we've seen that there's a change in demand from them. And I, I really think that going forward, um, there won't be many people going to restaurants and eating high-cut, high-value cut meat. Um, it will still happen, obviously, but I think a lot less. We need to change our look, uh, outlook with regards to what does the consumer want. But we need to be on the ground. We need to understand and we have our ear on the ground as to what do they want. Because some sucking um, can cost you money. So COVID, yes, in, influenced us very, in, in, in a very negative way. But it gave us a lot of opportunities as well. From the Feedlot Association, what we did was exactly what I said earlier is to say that let's stand still. Let's really look where we're going. Let's look at each individual business. Because if we look at feedlot in South Africa, we think there are many. There's approximately 75, 70 odd commercially viable feedlots. I'm not talking about the guy that has got 100 cattle here and 200 there. I'm, I'm talking about commercial feedlots that stand at least a thousand cattle, um, there's only 75 in South Africa. So we're telling these guys and everybody that are members to say that, take a look at yourself, um, reinvent, put up plans with regards to uh, risk management, put up plans with regards to where you want to be, relook your risks, mitigate them. Um, but at the end of the day, it goes to, we need to reinvent ourselves in this system. This is actually creating an opportunity for us to look forward because the new normal looks totally different. We're having a, a whole conference over, uh, over, over the week now. So we have to relook this. We have to re -ash it out. And I think this is creating masses, massive opportunities. I think we're going to see mergers and acquisitions going forward. One of the big points I'm saying to the guys speaking to me is look at partnerships. Partner with people that has got another side of the value chain either or partner with guys in the same position as yourself to create a, a value for yourself and for the industry at the end of the day. Yeah, I think post-COVID we're going to see some different ways of doing business, mergers and acquisitions. Uh, clearly, we're going to look at, uh, at new uh, efficiencies that we've got to drive in the market. So absolutely very valid point. So I think uh, that's right. Yeah, Johan, uh, uh, I'm going to get you to the pork and you now, uh, if you're ready for me. Uh, Johan, the, the, the pork industry has lifted its profile considerably over the last two or three or four years, um, uh, and it's, it's playing a, a bigger role in providing uh, nutrition, protein uh, uh, to, to, to the South African consumer. Uh, we, we see a, a lot of efficiencies growing in the pork industry. We're still a net importer of pork, if I have it correct. Uh, how do you see the pork industry and its competitiveness developing? And do you think we're going to get into a net export situation at some stage? Yeah, I think yeah. we first need to look at the local market. And uh, John, I think what you mentioned now, but, but the past three, four years, what happened with us is we've learned out of the, the trials and tribulations we had during the past three years. So if you have a look at Listeria, what Listeria did to us, um, if I, you have a look at African swine fever and the outbreaks of African swine fever, uh, food and mouth was a big one for us. So it's a difficult time. And out of it, I think four things that we've learned as an industry is that biosecurity is non-negotiable. 
um, by no terms. Food safety is inevitable. It doesn't matter who you are. If the, between poor and rich, the poorest people need the safest food. The third one is the road to market is, in South Africa specifically, and we talk local now, it is a, a huge challenge because I don't think we understand that, that, that road to market completely. And I think the fourth one is a strange one is we've seen it on the value chain. When we had Listeria, uh, it was a, a kind of a weak link in the value chain and the whole value chain just got, got damaged through uh, a link that wasn't, I, I won't say weak only, but maybe not prepared enough. And I think what we've learned is leadership in a value chain creates the strength of the value chain. And the stronger the value chain, the better for the whole of the value chain. So my take is as an industry, we are um, compelled to drive leadership in the value chain to make sure as a whole we are doing well and we profit as a, as a value chain. So I think one thing we need to talk about, and, and I don't think many people know this, uh, when you have a piece of meat, uh, on your plate, and let's talk fresh now, fresh meat. The decision of that piece of meat was made 365 days ago. So it means uh, a sow was inseminated and then the whole process started. So it's a long process and you can't just stop it. And the commercial production system we utilize in South Africa because of biosecurity is an all in all out system. So uh, I can't stop. It's not like, like Diewald's beef where you can say we hold back say for a week. We can't. There's a process. It's like a factory, and it's just pushing our pigs. So if we have a, a, a listeria outbreak, uh, you battle the issue by not having capacity to hold back. So you need to push your market. So it is a. It's, so our risk is totally or completely different than what you have, say, for instance, in the beef industry when it comes to a certain outbreak, because you can't hold back. If we look at the local market, and what is quite interesting to us is when we had Listeria, everybody thought that the whole industry is going to fall flat. It was a tough time for us, and we were not even in, in Poloni. Um, so how do, you, how do you conquer in a situation like this? And I think one thing that helped us is to say we're not going to run away from our problem, but we're going to eat our problem. We're not going to freeze it away because you're just uh, postponing the date of dealing with what you deal with, need to deal with. So... We had our best year ever uh, in producing and selling pigs in the same time that we had the stereo, that was about, roughly about six months. So we, we still see an increase uh, for the demand of pork, even though with the outbreaks and with difficult times. I think, so as an industry, we're quite excited that as pork, we, I think we, we have a good um, stance in the market. I think we have, as a product, we're doing quite well. And I think there's, there's more than enough space to grow the consumption of pork even in South Africa. We're quite low. We, we, between four and a half and five kilos per capita of pork, where you heard that, that chicken is 40 uh, per capita. So there's a lot that we can do, and the, the space is quite good for us to be in. I think if, if we talk local, we said for ourselves as an industry, the informal market is the market that we... Uh, I think to a certain extent, misunderstand the most. And if we talk about that as the behavior of the consumer, and I'm talking about the informal consumer, and then also the trading pattern from the day they bought their piece of meat and it sold into the informal market. Um, if, if we talk about the behavior, I've seen yesterday, everybody is talking about the low South African pork price now, and still the retail price is quite high. So somebody sent me a video or a little clip on uh, at least one of the retailers are pushing down their, their price now to 35 rand a kilo. But what they didn't see is it was 150 rand back. So it's quite huge. And it doesn't fit into the consumer space that where we want to be because they don't have reaches. Uh, it's not convenient for them. So price-wise and product-wise, size-wise and, and even cut-wise, I think we, we still need to learn a lot of the informal sector and how to penetrate into that market to fulfill that kind of behavior. I think something that's also going to, and I think it came out of this COVID um, lockdown that we have, and also I think the behavior of, of uh, consumers and traders all over the world, I think the whole world is going to go back to local again. Uh, I think the emphasis, we've lost a bit of our focus and emphasis on supplying locally from our local people. 
And I see the sentiment is coming back where people say, listen, for us to keep our jobs and to make sure that our people as a community is, is thriving and, and, and being profitable, we need to buy local. And I think by saying that it's not pulling down the efficiencies we have and, and uh, the production um, cost effectiveness that we strive for, I don't think it's going to do that. But I think local comes back in the sense of that we are good in what we do and we can supply and feed our nation. So I think a big focus for us is also SA Pork, the brand SA Pork, to push that into the market to say, but we are local and we support our local community. So informal trading is a big, big, big focus for us, understanding that environment and, and really uh, infiltrate the, the, the trading patterns, what they have, and not to disrupt the ecology they live in, but to advance the ecology and kind of add to what they have. And I think SA pork in the sense of being local, pushing the local production of whatever agriculture can provide in South Africa, and be only enthusiastic about this concept that we can feed the nation nationally. So I think that's more or less our, our national kind of footprint in, in uh, the view we have on our, our value chain for the national distribution of, of pork. Thank you, Johan. I, I want to get back to that informal market just now also on the COVID because if I've learned one thing from the COVID crisis is with all the commodities, how big the informal market is hmm. uh, in the pork industry, in the beef industry, in the poultry industry. The bread industry, uh, they say they, they, it's such a big market and it's, it, while it's informal, I think we, everybody has underestimated the huge impact it plays on food security. But we'll get there now. I just want to find out from you uh, the ambitions of the value chain in terms of penetrating markets outside of South Africa, perhaps in SADC, etc. Is uh, uh, how much is exported into SADC and, and, and further abroad? And is there really an ambition to, to penetrate that market? Yeah, John, I think, um, I think if I've, uh, what I've learned this morning also from the chicken people is their mindset is different. Uh, if you think uh, the immediate thing they said was we are, we are in Africa. So he doesn't think about the, the, the liabilities of being in Africa. He thinks about the opportunities. And I think what helped us a lot to trade internationally and to have an international focus uh, was the, the, the downfall we had with Listeria, um, the, the African swine fever outbreaks we had. Uh, I think out of that, we've learned that the moment you're in dire straits, you need to look for avenues that's maybe more difficult to penetrate, but to focus on. So on an international kind of focus, um, I can say to you, there's a huge focus for us to go international, although it's a difficult market for us to be in because we're so small. So we don't have volume. So we should also then focus on a niche market, what we do at this stage. So our exports are quite, quite low and small. So it's 2 to 4% of our total production, and that goes into more or less the SADC region and the, our neighbors. Uh, we do a little export into, in, back into Europe. Um, so I think it's a difficult one to anticipate, to say that we're going to conquer the world and we're just going to push as hard as we can into this space. Now, just to, to put you in perspective, China is the biggest producer of pork in the world. They have about 50 million sows. In South Africa, we have 115,000 sows commercially. So a difficult market to play in if you don't have volumes. But niche-wise, I think we're well prepared to do it. And in saying it, I think not many people know that our biosecurity standard in South Africa and our national commercial health herd status is of the best in the world. And that's purely because of the democracy we have in South Africa. We're all over South Africa, so we produce in the Western Cape, KwaZulu Natal, Mapumalanga, all over. So we, we have the ability to do it. Uh, compartmentalization started about eight years ago, and it was a, a venture between us as an industry and, and government, and that is reckoned in, in other countries. And that's what, what you're about saying, even though you have an outbreak, because we were locked down eight years ago on farms, we can still export, and we have export abattoirs to do it. However, if there's a downfall, and especially between governments in dealing with, say, health issues, and you push back your export into your, your local market, you've destro destroyed your local market. We've seen that even a 2 and a 3 and a 4% back into your market is just detrimental to price. So it's a difficult play to be in. So as an industry, what we do is we're quite selective on which markets we need to penetrate. So Asia is a big 
play for us uh, in the sense of a niche market. Then Africa trade is a big one because it's close to us. We understand our neighbors. I think the big thing is there is not that regulatory. If I have a look, regulatory between us and say Asia is much easier to export back into Africa. Um, and I think the free trade is going to open up much more to what we have now. So as an industry, we focus on bilateral trades, and that means relationships where government get involved with a, a, a neighbor where we export to and make sure that we, we, we have good relationships with, with the regulatory bodies that's governing our trade, bilateral trade negotiations. So I think um, as an industry, we have a lot of scope uh, in exporting. Uh, not an easy one to do because of our nature and who we are and also size. Niche-wise, magnificent, magnificent, we can play a fantastic role and we focus on that very specific to certain countries and then a huge focus on Africa because of the need we see. Uh, not an easy place to play in, but not unable to play into that space. I think one thing we need to say about international trade, and I think we don't talk a lot about uh, the, the free trade between the African countries. I think the risk that we see as an industry that's going to impose into us is uh, the fact that biosecurity in other countries may not be as good as what we have in South Africa. And we need to be able to manage that. If you have a free trade scenario and you venture into a, a bilateral trade towards trade and which is more relaxed than what we have now, the focus should be to say, how do you protect your health status? Because that is the huge, the, the massive asset that we always say we have as our, as our um, health status, and that's something you need to protect. But just, uh, just more directly, the COVID crisis and the lockdown, how has that impacted on, 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 on demand, and, and, and what challenges are the immediate challenges are there in the industry uh, at the moment? Yeah, John, I think um, the first thing we need to say is we're still producing and we're thankful that we have the opportunity to be essential. Um, and as big farmers, we, we said to ourselves, what a privilege it is still to be able to, op to be operational. Um, and the second thing is we believe that we have the ability to feed a nation in a farm which is kind, kind of desperate. I think one thing we've missed, and I don't, if I say we, are, I'm talking about the broader, broader decision makers, I don't think we understand the informal settlement uh, mm. setup and market that, that well. Um, if you think of somebody living informally, 70% of their, their total uh, economy comes out of informal trading. 40% of them don't eat at home. They eat from where somebody barbecued a shisanama piece of pork or meat or, or beef or chicken or whatever. Um, the moment we close down on that, then we kind of closed down on an informal trading channel that we never, never envisaged going to be, have such a great impact on our industry. So I think the informal trading side is the biggest uh, play that we miss now. There's no lack of demand for good food in South Africa. Um, yeah. The spendable income is down, but at the prices that we as farmers get now, it is possible to still feed the nation on, on what we have. So I think if, if you have a look at the value chain, farmer side, we're doing well. We're battling price, but we're still in production. If you have a look at the abattoirs, I think they've put a lot of good measures in place to make sure that they still keep themselves operational. The processing side is absolutely brilliant, and what they've done to mitigate the risk if somebody gets sick at the premises. And you need to understand the biosecurity levels that we imply is not something new. It's something we did for ages, for years already. So I think we're used to that. The only downfall we have is at the retail side. I think the retailers are battling um, to get stock, and I think they're not stocked enough or well enough, and I think it's a play because they also don't know the demand. And then I think the, the, the retail side uh, on the informal side is the, the effect that we all feel at this stage is, is kind of happening the whole value chain. Just to get back to, to the producers, John, and I think in a time like this, what do you say and how do you, how do you uplift people when they battle? Um, if I can, can maybe just record the phone calls, I get of desperate people phoning me and saying, Johan, I'm out. I don't know what to do. How do you handle this? And I said to our chairman a, a day or two ago, I said to him, Johan, you know what's interesting to me? When we had hysteria, I could, I, the desperation was different than what we had now. 
when I have phone calls now, it's still desperate and people are still emotional of, of, of being in, a, in, in dire straits. But what I sense is that there's hope that they would be able to conquer. And the next thing what I do sense is people have the ability uh, to be creative and innovative. And, and what is happening is they look at different markets now. They look at different ways of penetrating into a market that, that we should have been in, but we're not in. So what I enjoy of what happened to us as an industry through this difficult, the, the most difficult times we went through is we had a mind, mind shift change. And I think it's counting for us because if you're desperate and you live in fear and you, you dwell in an uncertainty as what we do now, you've lost the opportunity to see the new, the new possibilities. And what I sense is, and what I see is, and I think it's for the greater of South Africa's agriculture, it is our time because people need to eat. Uh, for us now, the, the greatest ability is to keep our vision and to make sure that we would be able to feed the nation, that we would be able to be, to be creative and have a new initiative to push into the space. So I think we, we, we are excited, even though it is desperate times and we battle where we are uh, price-wise. But as an industry, I can tell you that we say this is our time. We live for this. Biosecurity is our game. Food safety is our game. We have a fantastic product. We just need to find this market and the penetration into the market to, to, to make sure that, that we play the role that we think we can play. Uh, thank you, Ron, for those perspectives. And uh, very similarly, where we engage with government, we see now uh, from government, but also even from, from, from the, uh, the general public, a greater awareness of food and food security. Uh, and this, this really plays into, into our hands uh, to, to make food and food security for the country a real number one priority uh, in nutrition, etc., etc. So it, it is a good space. It's also creating opportunity for us to go forward. Uh, so thanks very much for those perspectives. Uh, Donnie, I can't see you, but I presume you are on the line. Good morning, Donnie. Hello, John. Uh, I'm on the line, if you can hear me. Yes, thanks very much, Donny. Okay, Donny, uh, we've now discussed with, with Martinez and Gerald and, and uh, with you, and all of them bring up the issue of biosecurity and, and uh, veterinary services, etc. And this is your game. Now, uh, we all see the opportunities in the animal production industry uh, growing industries, increasing and improving their competitiveness, but all of them uh, have a challenge around biosecurity, diseases, disease management, etc. Especially if we want to get into into global markets, etc. Uh, can you give us your perspective on on how well are we managing these diseases in South Africa, and where are the shortcomings, the deficiencies? Uh, in our biosecurity practices, and how do we cooperate better between government and private sector? Uh, the partnerships, I think Gilbert was also alluding to. How do we get those partnerships working better? So it's a bit of a mouthful, but I, we'd really like to have your perspectives on this because you work in this space. Yeah, John, thank you. Uh, the main thing is, uh, if you look at the extensive livestock production units, uh, We've heard about the chickens and, and the pork who have very good spice security plans in place. But now we go to the extensive um, areas where we have two things that we can't control. We can't control environment, uh, rainfall and everything that go with that, uh, food supply. And we can't control housing. And housing, I mean a closed system like uh, either in the chickens or in the pork system. So we have to live within that constraint that we have to do biosecurity there. And on the other hand, we have to get the vets involved. So um, for more than 30 years, we're trying to get veterinarians more involved at that level. And you have to understand that we have 200 plus veterinary practices in the countryside of South Africa, and it maybe don't sound that much, but it's more or less in every small district in the country, and if you go to the rest of Africa, you won't find that, and that is private veterinarians at that basis. So if we first look at the way that they did their business, 
The business model was very simple. You're in an area and there's clinical emergencies and you go and look after that and you also do some reproductive work like pregnancy diagnosis and, and bull testing. But in 30 years, we couldn't change that model, that business model, to get vets more involved in biosecurity because there was no business model that would pay them for that. Up to now, and I would say up to before the foot and mouth outbreak, basically anything from any farm could go into the market. There was no limitation. Uh, the market didn't say, what is your health status? Uh, there was just no limitation. And for that reason, the biosecurity plans and certification of animals to go into the system to the feedlots or where, where else, uh, there was no incentive from the farmer even to say, this is my health status and this is my biosecurity plans. This is my herd health plan. This is the diseases I've got in my herd. So on this extensive thing, we were uh, basically putting out fires the whole time. And my job to get the veterinary network together, working with guys like the feedlots, is now to get the vets off in the value chain. Because if we do the basic things on the farm, emergencies, set up the health plans, see that it's executed, we need to get an income somewhere from that process in order to then certify the end product. And, and that, that was the limitation so far uh, with the diseases coming, firstly with the foot and mouth, where the auctions was just closed overnight. I mean, that was a wake-up call, uh, showing people that they now need to have a certificate to say the animals didn't show signs of disease in the last 28 days. Uh, it was done quite haphazardly, but we, we coped with that, and we want to put a bigger plan in place now for that certification system, and we're talking to the Feedlot Association about that. Now with COVID, even further, there's more of awareness from people. People now understand disease transmission. They understand isolation. Uh, a lot of the concepts that before was not even mentioned, now it's everybody talk about it. Everybody <laughs> is even an expert <laughs> in that. Um, we as vets deal with diseases on a daily basis. We deal with outbreaks. And, and small outbreaks, out, outbreaks of blue tongue, of outbreaks of lumpy skin disease. So we, we um, looking back at the COVID now, we frown a little bit about the control that's been used in South Africa because we deal with real disease. Can I just ask you, I, I, I fully buy into that. I think that's absolutely the right development. But is, is the certification formalized with government? I'm, I'm just taking it from the crops point of view. If you buy crop seed, the whole certification of seeds in South Africa is, is a competency of the Department of Agriculture, uh, but it's been, it, uh, it's been delegated uh, to SAMSOR, the South African National Seed Organization, in other words, private sector. 
Uh, can't we get more certification and uh, programs like this uh, that, are, that are the responsibility of government seconded or delegated to, to, to private sector, to, to your network, for example? Yeah, I come, from, I come from an era where we were totally dependent on the state facility to make vaccines. And I was very involved with uh, launching the first international um, vaccine source from outside the country. Um, we're at a stage now that 98% of the vaccines that we need can be sourced from outside South Africa. And I must say there's very, very good vaccine manufacturers that is developing in South Africa at the moment. Um, so I don't foresee a problem with that. A, a, a specific exceptional case is like you mentioned in the case of food and mouth disease vaccine, which need a, a facility with a very high safety measures. Uh, we don't produce that in South Africa currently. Uh, I can foresee that if we do it and get it from Botswana and support them, there won't be a problem there. But at the end of the day, 98% of vaccines we can cater for from an international source as well as from new local sources, which uh, is developing rapidly uh, and, and quite incredible. So I don't think vaccine will be our limitation. Uh, it was a limitation all along, but we're overcoming that by for everyone that's not available from the state facility, like Brucella vaccine, we now already in the point where we can manufacture it locally, registration is in that vaccine will be available soon. So everyone where we had a problem, we can overcome food and mouth disease vaccine is the only one that you need a proper high security facility. Well, that is very good news and it's good to see the private sector are setting up um, the demand in that area and, and uh, getting involved in in research and innovation, uh, I, I think that is good news because that will support the, the competitiveness of our, of our industry. Uh, Dani, where do you see the, the real risk points uh, in, in, from a, from a uh, veterinary point of view? Do we have sufficient risk, uh, the monitoring of the, of the buffer zones? Where do you see our, 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 our real uh, major uh, risks? Uh, you, you mentioned the uh, Brucellosis, uh, are we doing enough? Yeah, if we, if we look at our disease reporting system, we can pick out the diseases which is a major crisis for our industry. Uh, if you look at brucellosis uh, as, a, as one example, it's not a disease that is uh, 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 visible. You can't see it, except in the case when an animal abort. So, for instance, for the feedlot association, it's not a big crisis uh, if they feed male calves or, or heifers. But for, for livestock production or cattle production, it is a major crisis. It is one of those hidden diseases. And like I said, again, people are now aware of diseases and transmission and carrier status. You know, the difference between brucellosis and the virus for which you get immunity in two weeks and then it's all gone, is that once the animal is infected, it's infected for life, and it's a life carrier, mm -hmm. and it will spread the disease without you even knowing it. Uh, so if you don't have the disease status, for instance, uh, it's unthinkable that cattle can change hands if you don't know the status of Brucella, uh, especially in, in, uh, for breeders. Uh, our other venereal diseases like trichomoniasis is, is totally out of control. Uh, so we don't have too little vets. We need to change the business model from an emergency service, because it's a very easy business model for vets to make a living, to a service of preventive um, uh, health and production management within a program. And so far... Uh, farmers were not willing to really pay the same type of money for disease prevention than for emergency care. So if we can change that narrative, and it's changing now, it's changing now specifically with the food and mouth, 
that you call your, uh, your, your market access is blocked if you can't say what is your status on a certain disease. Once we get to that stage, we have enough vets to implement biosecurity, the plans to eradicate certain diseases, uh, but there must be a need. There must be incentive. We have to find the incentive, and, and then it can be done. Right, thanks very much. I think that also goes to, to, to the status of auctions, and I think there's a lot of questions being asked. Are we monitoring sufficiently at auctions where uh, cattle and, and, and livestock are changing hands and, and not always knowing the disease uh, status? I think the auctions system is, is also under a lot of scrutiny in terms of transmission of diseases, etc. Am I right to say that? Yeah, you're totally right. You're totally right. Uh, the feedlots will know from their side whatever is picked up that, that auction. You know, viruses is the exchange from one animal from one group to another one. And that's simple. Business. It's not real major diseases, but that causes 80% of the problems in the feedlot, the respiratory diseases. If you look at the real infectious diseases, which affect uh, uh, animals that you, you, you breed with, I mean, that is a major crisis. And if you think about the auction as a system where you can monitor the disease status of the national herd, you're totally right. If you put your, if you put your, your focus there and you make sure that animals at auctions are surveyed, not even knowing the status, just to understand the size of the problem, there's a very, very specific place. But one thing that's going to happen with this whole COVID uh, is, and the foot and mouth disease outbreak is that electronic auctions is going to start dominating very, very soon. And when you do electronic auctions, then you want guarantees. Then you want guarantees. Then it's totally different because you're not there with the animals. Uh, and you can expect guarantees. And I think that is, the, for me, the most exciting development as it takes place now and where the vets then will totally get involved in certification. You know, before our law actually prohibited us to get involved in adding value to an extent, you're not allowed to ask commission, but you're allowed to certify animals. So we have to overcome that regulation as well. We have to get vets involved in the certification at auction level, especially if we now go to electronic auctions to a very large extent. Absolutely, and I think uh, uh, the space is changing post-COVID. We're going to do business a bit differently. So these are challenges that we, we, we've got to start thinking about. I, uh, we, we're going to start running out of time now, so I want to start with closing uh, statements. And I mean, one, uh, I, I know you indicated you want to say uh, also something on the biosecurity. So let's start with you. So if you have closing statements and any other aspects that you think that we need to highlight, uh, opportunity is yours. Yeah, I think, John, for, for me, biosecurity is a mindset. And I think, uh, Dan, Don, you alluded to that, that there's a mind shift, I think, amongst consumers, amongst uh, farmers. And I think uh, if we're going to look at government and say that government, they do not have the capacity to fulfill our needs, I think we're going to wait until doomsday. And I, to be honest with you, out of the pork industry, eight years ago, nine years ago, we started with compartmentalization, and they are the authors and the guardians of compartmentalization, and it's working. Um, so my take is I think what COVID-19 is also showing us, and that's what we've learned out of uh, a mishap in a value chain, we can't sit and wait until somebody is going to do something about the health status in South Africa. As a farmer, I always say to the farmers, if I talk to the minister, you know what, when I walk into your farm, you are the minister of the farm. And biosecurity starts at your own farm. So my take is, and I think what I've learned out of what Dani is also saying, is that we are now in a good space where biosecurity is so common sense to people that people are going to, their behavior is going to favor us being able to apply biosecurity in South Africa. And I don't think the government limits that. By no chance, not even the capacity in government. I think there's more than enough 
public private partnerships with government i think there's more than enough uh, willingness from government side for us industries as, and as individual producers to make sure that the biosecurity level in south africa is quite good so my take is i think and when we talk to farmers especially in our industry is to say you are the minister on your farm you are the first vet uh, when that vet walks into your farm he's the one that's going to talk to you the take is are you biosecure are you are you adhering to the rules that is international and what we've learned is if that mindset starts with the farmer itself and the value chain all of a sudden there's a huge push and the the environment thing for government is to support us in doing that so i, I personally believe i'm positive if you ask me can we as south africa uplift our biosecurity level yes we can i think if we're going to sit and wait and think it's government's play to do it i think we must have bust um it needs to start with us it needs to start by security needs to start with somebody buying saying listen i want to know what i'm buying and demand to know what you are buying because that then put pressure on the value chain to make sure that people are by secure and i think we can i i i think as an industry and i'm talking about the whole agricultural industry in south africa we have such beautiful product, products and i think we can do it we we have the favor now of the time that people are no mindful of what is happening with with covid-19 and we can just apply what we have so i'm quite positive about what don is also saying and i think the role that we need to play as industries as vets as a whole value chain there's not a, a greater demand than what we have now to 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 play that role thank you yon give out from your side any comments that you want to add Yeah, John, um, I think just a comment with regards to the international market. What we saw is that there are certain markets that opened, us, opened up for us. Because of this pandemic, uh, if we look at specifically, for example, India, I mean, they export water buffaloes throughout the world and mainly in northern Africa um, every year. But what now has happened is they, they have closed down the export of water buffalo, which actually through this opened up a opportunity for us to export meat to northern african countries so there's opportunities um international decisions made by other countries actually create opportunities for us and we need to rethink what we sell how we sell it and to whom do we sell it. um and thirdly my thing is from an industry body an industry perspective locally and internationally we've got to ask ourselves continually are we relevant and do we add value and through all of this we've seen that as a um, the, the 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 impact that the, the farming and the agricultural community community had on this disease and the outbreak and the whole social impact social economical impact is yes we add value and we are relevant thanks so much for that uh, martinez i'm coming uh, back to you now uh, uh, I also want to ask you around the informal sector. We didn't go too much into the informal sector in the, in the poultry industry, but I had uh, some really interesting discussions with Isam Breitenbach from Sapa recently, uh, and I learned a lot around the informal sector, and it's come up in a couple of the discussions. But 30% of, of the broiler industry is live fowls that go into the informal sector. And um, how do you see this uh, market developing uh, further? Yes, John. Um, I think it's an uh, important uh, uh, part of the market. Um, it's, a, it's a traditional part of the market. It allows uh, people to be um, self-sufficient, to own their own businesses. Uh, so it's an enterprise opportunity. I think the uh, biggest suppliers, the fully integrated suppliers, um, they have the capacity and um, have managed to sustain it, to supply their old chicks uh, to the informal market. So you need uh, big also to uh, su support small uh, via the master plan. We're obviously very aware of what the needs are. Um, most of it centers around market access, centers around uh, you know getting finance, uh, but uh, indeed a very important part of the market. 
I want to get back to you too on, on, on the, uh, obviously animal feed is such an important part in, the, in your competitiveness uh, drive. And uh, we see we've got a good maize crop out there, so maize prices will probably for the foreseeable future, or at least for the next year, be at, at, uh, at export parity, which does help uh, your competitiveness. Any comments on the, on the animal feed side, which I know is really always a, a big factor in your competitiveness uh, drive? Right, um, John, yeah, at, um, at the AFMA uh, conference, um, I uh, I joked about the fact that you know we always debate who came first, the chicken or the egg, and I maintain it's the feed. So uh, yeah, feed and feed cost uh, it constitutes about um, seventy percent of the total cost of growing a chicken. Sixty percent of that is is uh, maize, thirty percent soya. So uh, yeah, we're looking forward to a good crop. Uh, all the signs are good. Uh, we obviously are up against the exchange rate because everything is ultimately determined by the Chicago uh, Board of Trade. Um, but feed is absolutely uh, crucial to, to what we do. So it's a bit of a green shoot out there. Yes, we have COVID. We have to uh, contend with um, what the impact will be on the consumer uh, and if on the demand side. Uh, and particularly in which channel, so might be doing some footwork to reposition ourselves. Um, but certainly one of the green shoots is um, is the maize crop out there. Um, so looking forward to, to swiftly uh, fast forwarding a few months. That's good. Perhaps just in, in conclusion, uh, Martinez, if you were to list the three major risks that you see for your for your industry, for the value chain, the broader value chain at this stage, what would those three be? Just, just, just in naming them. Um, John, I think uh, demand uh, and what ultimately COVID is going to do to demand and uh, and and specifically in which channels. Um, I think the other big risk factor. Uh, would be uh, would be other disease. So we see a lot of bird flu currently in Europe, um, also in some states in the uh, United States. So um, that tends to to you know give us some warning signals, um, and it's something that we are obviously highly alert. Um, and and uh, something that we need to prepare for. Uh, we're entering in the winter months. So uh, always on our radar, but even more so uh, in the colder conditions. Right, fantastic. But any any other comments, uh, Donny, from yourself? Any comments that you uh, want to make uh, from a veterinary point of view, but uh, and the role that uh, diseases play in, in competitiveness that you that you feel that we haven't uh, touched on that we need to to enlighten a bit. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, John. Um, we we have to, to use this opportunity. Uh, we we're only going to have the opportunity right now. And from a veterinary side, we have a huge opportunity. We're talking about the feedlot industry about uh, about that. Our our members, uh, the two hundred vets out there, do in excess of mm -hmm. two million pregnancy diagnoses uh, every year. So they get on the farm. But the the unique thing about that is. They get onto the farm at the same stage when we wean the calves. So we do the pregnancy diagnosis two months after the end of the breeding season, and that's precisely when the calf is more or less seven months old. So we're right there basically to certify those calves, to certify the conditions on the farm and that the animals was not mixed with other ones. And the, and the opportunity lie in that that we need to start with a project. We need to start with a definitive project getting involved, vets involved in certification. We used to certify bulls for breeding soundness and for pregnancy, but not for disease status um, as such. So if we can pull this one off, and it won't just happen this year, it will be a program that built over the next five years, we need one practical program to get vets involved and 
and the certification of the winner cars going to the feedlot, telling the feedlot what programs is on place on that farm. Animals are identified within the lit system type of setup. Uh, there's a traceability to the feedlot and back to the farmer. So we need to start with one specific uh, section and make that work, and the rest will follow, especially with this awareness about biosecurity, mm -hmm. and, and then expand that to the breeders, to the, to the stud market when they sell animals, that we get to a stage where we can certify the status of the animals, not only the genetics, but also the health status is as important. Right. Thanks very much, Lonnie. Uh, I think this has been a really great panel discussion, and I want to thank each one of you, Don, yourself, Martinez, Johan, and Gerald, for your insights. Uh, I've learned a lot. Uh, it's always great listening to you. To, uh, so knowledgeable uh, in the fields that you work, and uh, it, 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 uh, such a good thing for South African agriculture that we know that you are involved in driving competitiveness of the value chains uh, and making sure that our food system is world class. Because I think we have a world class food system, and if we have it, if we approach it in this manner uh, of looking at competitiveness, of looking at where the, the problem areas are, but also where the opportunities are, and we can collaborate the way we are. Uh, we can take us to the next level, and I think the, the first COVID in the world is going to create opportunities uh, that we need. So I want to thank each one of you. Thanks very much for your contribution. This has really been uh, very positive uh, to be part of this. Thank you very much. John, I'm going to talk about the first time I've been here. It's Francois, so very thank you. It was a very interesting session. Every one of you, I've been sitting and listening to you. Um, elke in zijn gesprek en ik ach ik moet zo maar net zeggen ik is trots op uh, op die value chain en in, uh, in jullie individuele bijdrage. Ons het iets tekenen mens en dit is eigenlijk maar wat ons wil oorboek um, aan die hele value chain. Je weet wat ze iets tekenen um, nou ja weet ons binnen um, in elke value chain en wat ze kwaliteit mens het. Ons jullie was een weerspiegeling daarvan. So, ons uh, ons zit nog een dank voor die formaat. Ik denk ons met die ding wel een langer in een ongoing gesprek maak, want uh, weet die interactie wat vanmorgen um, tussen jullie ook plaatsgevind het, is precies wat ons wil bereik. Um, so, baie, baie dankie John, jy het uitstekend gelei en vir elkeen van jullie, ek het groot waardering dat jullie tijd spandeer het, ja. Dankie. Okay. Dankie okay, Fransoa, baie dankie. Dankie Fransoa. Ja, dankie vir die geleentheid jylle. Eet braai vleis, braai vleis. <laughs> Ja. Park, waar is die van die park? Ek moet elke keer gebruik. Na Bolton, man. Ja, Ek sal um, met julle elke keer een gesprek, een gesprek twee na, um, en ons het nou klomp, ons het nou, soos Frans wat sê, het ons gesels oor een moeilike um, aanpassing aan die formaat, dat ons het vinniger by mense kan kry, en het ook al helemaal een langer, langer interactie maak tussen ons, um, meer een, een lang termijn, denk. Ons sal met julle elke keer gesels en julle bel die naam, en verskrikkelijk baie dankie, en vir julle tyd vir oogend, en ek hoop dat julle wonderlijke en een gesteelde dag verder sal het vandag. Dankie julle ook, my blij. Dankie julle, baie dankie. Dankie, dankie.